It looks like we have people still filing into the virtual room here, which is totally fine. And I'll go ahead and broadcast the results for our presenter here. So our colleagues at Zero Abuse can see where folks are falling. It looks like we got people here between uh, minimal and moderate here as far as uh, how they're rating the current knowledge. So thank you all for completing that poll. All right, another quick poll question. I'm going to go ahead and end that. Again, thank you all for completing that. Um, Another quick poll for everyone that we want to know. Uh, what is your profession? Please note that you have several options here, uh, prosecutor, medical professional, law enforcement, CPS worker, uh, FI, forensic interviewer, uh, mental health professional, victim advocate. You can go ahead and easily click on the um, circle, if you will, that's right next to the option that you have here. And when you click on that circle, it will record your answer. Uh, no need to type anything into the chat unless you select other because you don't see your profession here. You can then type in your profession if you do not see it. But if you do see it, go ahead and just take your mouse or take the button and click right there next to the option. And I'm going to broadcast these results for our presenter. It looks like, uh, Robert, we have about uh, close to 20% at uh, prosecutor, 20% in law enforcement, another 14% uh, victim advocate, 23% other that I think they're maybe typing in the chat, those who are indicating other, 9% mental health uh, professional, 4% forensic uh, interviewer, 11% CPS workers, um, no medical professionals as of yet. Uh, I'll leave this up for maybe another. 10 or 5 seconds for people to record their answer. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for completing that poll. I uh, appreciate it. And I'm going to go ahead and end that poll question there. Uh, but we have a good sense of uh, who's joining us today as far as the profession. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our presentation. Again, good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're calling from, and welcome to today's webinar. He said, she said, um, we looked. He said, she said, we looked. How to find corroborating evidence. Uh, this is brought to you by our colleagues at the Zero Abuse Project. Uh, my name is William Moore, and I want to go over a few uh, Adobe Connect technology uh, pieces just to keep in mind while you enjoy today's webinar. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be published on our Intech YouTube page. The webinar, uh, the Intech YouTube page includes past uh, webinars, including, including past zero abuse webinars, where you can easily go and view those. If you'd like to get access to the transcript or any supporting materials related to any of the webinars that you view, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For those wishing to download a copy of uh, important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly next to the chat pod here. Uh, here you'll be able to uh, find important documents, including an FAQ uh, and troubleshooting document that can help with any of your technology uh, questions that you may have around Adobe. Please note that we will have a question and answer uh, portion of today's webinar. Uh, feel free to go and uh, submit your questions to our presenter in the chat box. Select enter or the bubble icon and it will uh, record your message and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during our presentation. And really quickly, if you all can help us count, um, we know that individuals may, in some circumstances, be viewing today's webinar in a group. So that being said, if you're viewing in a group, meaning you have additional people in the room with you, please type the total number of additional people that are joining you for today's webinar. So for example, uh, if it's me and my dad watching uh, Robert's presentation today, I will put in plus one. 
because that is the additional person that I have with me. So please be sure to go in and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today, not including yourself. If you're by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. Please note that individuals who are signed in will receive an automated email uh, and a feedback email that will include your certificate of attendance. That is only for people who are signed in virtually into the room. However, if you have individuals that uh, are joining you in a group and you would like for them to receive a certificate, uh, you can please contact the OJJDP help desk and send over the group validation form. The group validation form is located in the handouts pod. You can download it uh, and you can send it into the OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov and we will get a certificate for those additional people in the room with you. Remember, only for additional people. If you're viewing and you're checked in, no need to fill out that form, you will receive an automated email with your certificate and the feedback uh, opportunity. So here's a quick glance of our agenda today. And I would now like to turn it over to our presenter, uh, Robert Peters, for today's presentation. Robert, take it away. Well, thank you, William. Great to be here. Uh, this is a topic uh, that I'm certainly passionate about, and I know several of you all are as well. And it really dictates the outcome in many of our cases, the efforts and the creativity we show uh, when corroborating these types of offenses. My name is Robert Peters, Senior Attorney of the Zero Abuse Project. Previously, I was Senior Cyber and Economic Crime Attorney with the National White Collar Crime Center. And before that, I was a prosecutor in multiple jurisdictions in West Virginia. The title of today's topic, He Said, She Said, We Looked. Uh, certainly this is a phrase that's often used uh, just in the field uh, and to some extent certainly understand it, right? Um, these cases often do rise and fall on the statements of uh, children. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes when I've heard he said or she said said uh, by investigators or others that I've worked with, uh, oftentimes it's an excuse to not dig further. Every case starts out uh, it, to some extent by a complainant. Uh, and by uh, the target of the of the allegations, right? That's where we as investigators, uh, that's where we as prosecutors step in and we do our job. Every case should begin uh, perhaps as a he said, she said, or, or she said, he said, whatever the case may be. Uh, but that's where we step in, we do our job, and we bring clarity to the situation and potentially criminal charges. Quick plug, uh, we are very grateful to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office of Justice Programs uh, at the Department of Justice, and of course, NTAC, uh, for supporting us in this presentation. We're grateful for that funding and all it enables us to do for the field. We do provide free training and technical assistance to law enforcement and prosecution. So if there's any way I can assist you uh, in any of your cases, please feel free to reach out to me uh, or my colleagues at Zero Abuse Project. You have the email address there, robert.peters at zeroabuseproject.org. Few disclaimers, of course, none of this is intended uh, to constitute legal advice and is not legal advice. I was really excited uh, watching uh, the chat as you all were announcing where you're from. Uh, everywhere, it seems, Guam, Alaska, Hawaii, Alabama, uh, and everywhere in between. That's fantastic. Uh, regrettably, I am not a, uh, a great uh, authority on the law in all of those jurisdictions. I happen to think I'm OK uh, in jurisdictions where I've practiced. That's about the extent of it. So certainly consult with your local prosecutor or attorney for guidance. Uh, don't take what I say as, as, as absolutes. Uh, please consult your local jurisdictions and ensure uh, that I'm not uh, misleading you to do something that is not uh, optimal in your jurisdiction. If you hear something particularly insightful or helpful today, odds are very good uh, that it came from Victor V, uh, the Director of Education and Research at Zero Abuse Project or any of our other talented Zero Abuse Project team members who gave significant content and research contributions to this presentation. And speaking of contributions from others, uh, I stole this idea uh, with permission from Jerry Seitz a great trainer with the Southern Regional CAC. She begins her presentations this way, and now I do as well. Um, probably most of you are, uh, if you're taking notes on uh, on your laptop, on Microsoft Word, feel free to just make a couple columns uh, or, or headings. Uh, if you're a paper note taker, I encourage you to do this on a sheet of paper. And just as we talk today, and you hear things that are maybe different, 
uh, or you haven't heard for a while, jot those down on that left column under ideas. And then before you hop on to your next Zoom call or whatever the case may be, I encourage you to write in the right column, how can I apply this to my practice uh, and how can I do so uh, for the benefit of, of the children I serve, either directly or indirectly. Uh, and I encourage you to do that uh, as a way to, to really implement it. We want to give you some great practical pointers, uh, but ultimately it's pointless if you're not able to implement those uh, into your important work. Quick agenda from a substantive standpoint. Uh, we're, of course, going to go over some general structural issues that might assist us in collecting corroborating evidence. We're going to talk about the forensic interview not as an end-all, uh, not as uh, the, 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 the summation of an investigation, but as a roadmap to an investigation, as the beginning, really, of an investigation. We'll have a couple pointers for suspect statements, so that won't be a, a lengthy focus. We'll talk about the importance of prior bad acts, maybe some potential places we can look for prior bad acts. We'll also talk about physical evidence. We know uh, we don't always have that. Uh, and then we'll talk, we'll shift gears and, and focus more on some tech pieces, social media evidence and digital evidence. That's a lot, uh, and we will fly right through it, uh, but it's a great topic, and we hope you find it helpful. Let's begin with structural issues. On the right side, you have a great resource, The Investigation and Prosecution of Child Abuse. This was compiled by Victor Veith uh, a decade and a half ago. It still was very useful to me in my work, uh, and I know many other prosecutors who have found it useful uh, discussing some of the best practices for child abuse prosecution. We know one of those best practices is that it needs to be an immediate response. Uh, this is not something uh, that we can sit on or, or that can wait. Uh, these, these are things that do require an immediate uh, collaborative response. We also know it requires specialized units. Uh, in some jurisdictions, there is a mindset uh, that, oh, any uh, officer uh, or any prosecutor uh, or any individual uh, is capable of handling any kind of case. That's nonsense. Uh, you don't, uh, next time you have a, uh, a heart palpitations, you're not going to go to a foot doctor, nor, and nor vice versa. Specialization leads to excellence, it's the same in, crim in criminal context. There is a lot of specialized training that goes into uh, child abuse investigation and prosecution generally, uh, especially where we're bring, we bring in the technology facilitated pieces of it, which um, intersect with every case. So there's a lot going on here. This isn't something that should be piecemeal, uh, piecemealed out to patrol units on a rotating basis. This is something that needs to be done uh, by specialized units who know what they're doing or experienced in what they're doing. We need to be using child advocacy centers. Uh, every piece of an investigation and a prosecution needs to be done in a victim centric way. Uh, and I know we have uh, some international attendees, which is fantastic, uh, very excited by that. Um, and even many, some jurisdictions in the United States uh, could certainly uh, benefit uh, additionally from the CAC approach, the Child Advocacy Center approach. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, you know, this is a place where instead of a victim uh, being interviewed, you know, 5, 10, 15 times and reliving that trauma again and again and again and again, it's done in a trauma-informed way by someone who's trained uh, to not use leading language or suggestive language uh, according to a protocol that's scientifically based and legally defensible. It's done in a setting uh, that is sensitive uh, and, and tailored to the child, not to the adults interviewing the child. Um, it provides tremendous value for the child, uh, and it's an important piece of investigations and trauma-informed investigations. Likewise, we need highly trained forensic interviewers uh, who know the protocol and who know how uh, to interact in an appropriate way that does not create legal issues later on. We also need to involve the prosecutor early. Um, I've spoken to over half of the jurisdictions uh, in the United States at some point uh, just over the course of the past year, uh, and in many jurisdictions, prosecutors aren't involved until post-arrest. That's a terrible idea. There are a variety of things uh, that could use prosecutorial input and guidance early in the process that the prosecutor has to deal with later on and, and that could almost certainly be mitigated by earlier prosecutor uh, involvement, especially earlier informed prosecutorial involvement. Uh, so certainly we need to be involving our prosecutors. We need to have a investigation protocol that's tailored to our needs. Uh, so, for example, there was a question that uh, one of you submitted in advance of the presentation from Alaska that asked how CPS can work with law enforcement without compromising investigations. Well, that's certainly something that's going to look different jurisdiction to jurisdiction, depending on, uh, you know, what CPS looks like, what their capacity are, what the type of case is. 
Uh, but certainly there has to be that communication between CPS and law enforcement so defendants uh, perhaps aren't tipped off about a CPS investigation and then they go rush and destroy potentially corroborative evidence uh, while it's still on the back burner with law enforcement. There has to be a protocol that establishes that they're on the same page, uh, where there's uh, mutual expectations that are followed uh, and clearly communicated, uh, and so, so investigations aren't compromised. Uh, and so certainly that needs to be a collaborative process. Potentially, uh, some of these things can be can be done collaboratively. That's where the CAC plays a great role, where instead of CPS talking to a child, law enforcement talking to a child, everyone else talking to a child, it's done one time, uh, it's recorded, uh, and, and CPS and law enforcement are viewing it uh, remotely uh, and, and providing input, and it's all clarified in one setting, so it's done collaboratively. Uh, there's not, it's not compromised. Likewise, obviously, the taking of suspect statements certainly needs to be coordinated across agencies. So one question, of course, to ask is, do you have a written investigation protocol for your multidisciplinary team? A follow-up question is, do you follow it? Uh, everything in that protocol certainly requires justification. Another relevant question, does it need updated in the COVID-19 era? Have there been changes to the protocol that you've adopted uh, but maybe aren't uh, enshrined in the written protocol itself? Certainly that's a good thing to do uh, to ensure that everyone is, is working off the same sheet of music. All right, we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of an immediate response. Uh, this is an important article uh, by Detective Mike Johnson who talks about that. The investigative windows of opportunity, the vital link to corroboration in child sexual abuse cases. Uh, a lot of times this takes on the dynamics of domestic violence, any of you that have worked those types of cases. Um, as I prosecuted several of those cases, and with domestic violence, you really win or lose those cases typically depend, or not typically, but often depending on what uh, investigators do or fail to do the night that they initially respond. So did the officers immediately separate everyone present? Did they take separate statements, lock everyone into statements early on, or did they not do that? Uh, did they maybe interview the victim in the presence of the perpetrator where the victim was subject to coercive influence, either direct or implied? Uh, did the officer give the defendant, uh, the defense witnesses time to fabricate something plausible? Maybe you don't even have the story uh, from the defense perspective until you get to trial when they reviewed your discovery exhaustively and they've gotten together and they've taken the time to fabricate something that plausibly meets uh, uh, some, some sort of mitigating uh, uh, fabricated scenario. That's important, and that, that's why we need to have these immediate responses. We need to get on it immediately. Some smaller jurisdictions, I prosecuted solely in small rural jurisdictions, uh, they often let the patrol handle these things initially. Um, and by, by that, I mean child abuse cases. They'll, they'll let them handle it initially if they're on call during a night shift. Well, that's not acceptable. Uh, and I know that's a difficult thing to say, given the manpower limitations, the personnel limitations. But we really have to have specialized units uh, intervening immediately in these cases, even in our rural jurisdictions, certainly. Likewise, we need to limit the investigators involved. I did policy debate at the uh, great institution of West Virginia University several years ago, um, and I remember I was in a debate, uh, it may have been with Cornell University, uh, and they had uh, 10 people floating around the debaters, handing them random pieces of paper that had different arguments and pieces of evidence on them, and uh, we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. But West Virginia University had a, certainly had a smaller budget at that time, um, and it was just the two of us prepping for the debate. And those debaters were lost. Uh, they had no idea what they had. It was way too complicated. There were way too many people involved, and so they weren't able to be successful. Uh, so we need to have a limited number of investigators involved uh, so there's a comprehensive grasp of the facts and circumstances of the case. Now, certainly that looks different depending uh, on the case. Um, so it's some, if it's something that more, that's more complicated, uh, you might need additional investigators involved, uh, but we need to not be passing cases around. We need to have them with, with an individual or individuals who have the opportunity to really have a comprehensive grasp of what is occurring. Likewise, we need to limit the prosecutors involved. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit at length, but this is a this is important even for a trauma informed approach, um, and we'll we'll break that down a little bit. So they have to be involved. Prosecutors have to be involved from the outset. Uh, again, as I as I said earlier, uh, waiting until criminal charges are filed is just simply not going to be a good idea. Um, we need to be getting those calls as as things are coming down the pike. 
And why? Because according to the National Sexual Violence uh, Resource Center, this is really best practices for prosecution for a variety of reasons. You see here that they recommend vertical prosecution, that concept uh, where the same prosecutor, who's specially trained, is assigned that case from beginning to end, top to bottom. And that way, victims are able to work with the same prosecutor and, and investigator uh, from the time first the, the potential charges are first reviewed all the way through to the sensing of the offender. In working uh, with many survivors of abuse, that's a frequent complaint, the turnover that we do see in law enforcement and prosecution, uh, where they would be handed, the case file would get handed from prosecutor to prosecutor, again, having to reestablish rapport, uh, rework through really painful details, often not in a very trauma-informed way. Uh, it, was something that contributed uh, to the fact that victims did not feel supported by the system, understandably, because that process where vertical prosecution is absent, it's not reflective of a focus uh, on the survivors, at least impliedly. So we see uh, a couple reasons why we might want to do this just from a practical standpoint. It improves conviction rates, which is a good thing. It provides more consistent, appropriate sentencing when you have the same individuals involved. And as we just said, it does reduce victim trauma. So the National Sexual Violence Resource Center says it is therefore considered best practices. All right. Uh, we certainly need to be aware of polyvictimization uh, research when we're talking about best practices uh, for prosecution and investigation and corroboration. We need to understand uh, that typically there's going to be more than one form of victimization present. So we need to be alert for that when we are collecting corroborative material. Uh, almost 66% in this one study was exposed to more than one type of victimization. We see that in the study, 30% experienced five or more types of victimization, be that physical, sexual, emotional, neglect. 10% experienced 11 or more different forms of victimization in their lifetimes. Uh, and we know there, of course, is a correlation between that polyvictimization uh, and trauma symptoms uh, as opposed to just one form of victimization that occurs over and over and over again. Um, so we need to be aware of that. If we're not looking for a broad uh, array of potential trauma, we're going to miss corroborative material. That's important, incidentally. I saw we had a great, uh, uh, great attendance today from forensic interviewers and CAC personnel, victim advocates. This is why it's important in forensic interviews, interviews to not fixate on a single uh, piece uh, or, or potential allegation. If you believe that there was sexual abuse in a case, absolutely, these are all things, forms of maltreatment that we need to explore. But you need to open that up for physical abuse, potentially, emotional abuse, potentially. And when you do that, you're going to find additional corroborative evidence and potentially additional criminal charges. All right, we talked about the forensic interview as a roadmap early on. Let's break that down a little bit. I do want to say there is a tremendous importance uh, to forensic interview training. And remember, on the topic of forensic interview as a roadmap, uh, it's the beginning of an investigation, not the end of an investigation. I was doing a training, uh, and I will uh, I'll, I'll withhold names to protect the guilty, uh, but I was doing a training in another state, um, and uh, I talked about this dynamic of, of when this isn't done, uh, when this is sort of viewed as the end of an investigation, and I asked an audience of all prosecutors, you know, how long have you, how many times have you seen um, where you have a forensic interview and you have a suspect interview and those are the only pieces of evidence uh, that are in your case file? And one of the answers I got was, all I have is a forensic interview. Uh, and, and we know defendants lawyer up and this is sometimes that's unavoidable. Uh, but regardless, uh, there's so much room, uh, so much of, of, of case building that's missed when we do that. Uh, one of you from California uh, asked uh, as a question, how can cases be proven without the victim's testimony? Well, the forensic interview itself uh, might come into play depending on the age of the child. According to Ohio v. Clark, a 2015 U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, children, uh, very young children, will rarely, if ever, implicate the confrontation clause. That's a direct quote from Ohio v. Clark. Now, certain states, um, that, that can be more of a challenge than others. Uh, so if you can find a relevant hearsay exception, maybe the victim doesn't have to testify uh, if it falls into that, that spectrum of Ohio v. Clark. And there's a variety of hearsay exceptions uh, that, that Zero Abuse Project trains on, certainly the medical treatment exception, uh, many, there are many others, effect on the listener, things of, of that nature. Uh, but there are a variety of ways that perhaps we can get those statements in depending on the age of the child. Sometime, and of course, if the child testifies, that opens up a variety of things as well. Just a broader point, cases can be proven without victim's testimony when we're able to hunt down uh, some of the broader corroborative evidence that we discuss uh, throughout this workshop.
So forensic interview training, as we know, is very important. Experiential training is very important. Um, we have a great course at Zero Abuse Project called Forensic Interviewer at Trial, where prosecutors and forensic interviewers uh, participate jointly, and the prosecutor uh, runs the forensic interviewer through a direct examination. Uh, either myself or Victor Veith will cross-examine and, and channel our most uh, obnoxious defense personas, uh, and then the prosecutor rehabilitates. Uh, you know, there's that experiential training piece is really important. We know from research uh, that it is it's it's just really helpful. It it has efficacy. Uh, we know it improves uh, the way that we do our work. Corroboration in photographs uh, certainly important. Um, Victor, of course, has a couple some great pieces on this. You see there when the child has spoken, corroborating the forensic interview uh, that breaks down some of the things we're going to discuss today and several others. I encourage you if you're looking for if you're confused by the concept of 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 the forensic interview as a roadmap, check out Victor's article, which is available to you. Victoria just posted a, uh, or, or it's available to you, I believe, in the handout section. Encourage you to check that out. Uh, it's the When the Child Has Spoken PDF link, and that'll break down some of these considerations. Uh, also, picture this photographing uh, child sexual abuse crime scene. Um, we'll, we'll get, we'll break these down in a bit more details. So if we're going to view the forensic interview as a roadmap, we, of course, need to closely examine the victim's statement. And we can't be assuming uh, that certain things uh, are, are just too ridiculous to follow up on. Um, so, for example, I had a case where a child disclosed uh, that the defendant would show uh, the child pornography, uh, and the uh, defendant kept this pornography in a pinata. A bit bizarre, but when we served a search warrant, what do we find? Pornography in a pinata. Um, sometimes we see more fantastical disclosures. So a child who makes the disclosures uh, the, these fantastical disclosures and isn't believed. Um, and some of them we knew didn't actually occur. You know, for example, you'll hear things like, oh, uh, after this happened, I shot the defendant in the face. Well, we know the defendant is still alive. We know the defendant was not shot in the face. Uh, and yet, uh, and yet this child has made this disclosure. Well, sometimes there's a reason for that. Uh, sometimes uh, we might need expert testimony to explain the context of these sort of uh, empowerment narratives where a child's attempting to take over control over what occurred. Um, and so we can explain that through expert testimony. But we can't always just assume that. Um, for example, the child who said, uh, you know, there's a, uh, who had made all these uh, disclosures uh, of what occurred uh, in, a, in a sexual context uh, isn't believed and then shows up to school one day and says, hey, there's a dead guy in the bathtub. And fortunately, that time, what she said was taken seriously, and it turns out there was, in fact, a dead guy in the bathtub. Uh, mom was a drug dealer, uh, or mo rather, mo her mother had a drug dealer. She was a drug user. The drug dealer overdosed uh, in the restroom. The child knocks on the door and says, hey, can I, can I use the restroom? And uh, mom says, hang on, sweetie. She rolls the dead drug dealer into the bathtub and says, come on in. You can use the restroom. Sure enough, there was a dead guy in the bathtub. So we can't always assume uh, that, that these things are outlandish. Well, they might be outlandish, but we can't assume they're false. So maybe instead of dismissing things out of hand, maybe we should think from a child's perspective. So for example, uh, I've seen children who refer to vibrators as microphones, and to have that visual on the screen, um, that makes sense from a child's perspective. I've uh, heard children who refer to uh, condom receptacles as worms. Well, that's going to take some work. We need to look at those statements that make us pause for a second and think like a child, what might, what might those be, and we can get some really great uh, corroborative evidence as a result. Motive evidence. So, for example, if we're searching uh, maybe the child's house or perpetrator's house, investigators should really look for uh, letters, artwork, gifts that the child has made um, or otherwise presented to the perpetrator. Uh, so, for example, there was one case where a victim made his father an award on the computer and announced that his father was the greatest, uh, greatest dad in the world. And so investigators took that as evidence that the child loved the perpetrator. And then in closing argument, the prosecutor used that evidence to show the child had no incentive to lie. We simply don't lie uh, to get into trouble the people we love. That was helpful as motive evidence. And incidentally, that's one example of, of how we need to take a broader view of what constitutes uh, corroborative evidence. There was another really important question um, uh, that was asked that's related to uh, that's related to motive evidence. So, for example, one of you asked, "How often are child drawings used 
to corroborate uh, child statements. And uh, it depends. Certainly the drawing has to be relevant. When we say drawings, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conceiving of that question as the child drawing maybe on that flip chart that we often see in forensic interview uh, rooms. And, and so the, that drawing has to be relevant. If the child shows, uh, or it could be a variety of other uh, drawings. So for example, similar to the case we just talked about, if the child shows love for a father uh, by giving him a drawing, you know, world's best dad, uh, that shows she has no motive to lie, so that's relevant, should be admissible. If the child draws a sexual act, that could show that the child has unusual sexual knowledge. Um, and again, in the forensic interview room, if the child is sketching out a bedroom, well, maybe that's just a tool to help her explain herself. Um, and, and so uh, we don't know, I'm not sure how often drawings are collected. I know they were collected in a few of my cases, but it is certainly one thing uh, we should be looking for. So that was a good question. Sexual oddities. There was a case in South Carolina where a child was asked about sounds uh, that daddy makes when he was sexually abusing her. And the girl said that he makes a whinny sound, like that of a horse, a horse whinny. Well, rather than just taking that as ridiculous and saying, oh, this, is a, you know, this, is a, this child is incredible, the investigator did the work. He didn't stop it. He said, she said. He, then he did the work. And he interviewed the suspect's wife. He interviewed uh, several other sexual partners of the suspect and found out that, guess what? The man made a whinny sound as he approached climax. That is powerful, corroborating evidence. How else is the child going to know the sounds a man makes uh, when he has an orgasm if she herself has not been abused. That's powerful corroborative evidence. Um, other sexual oddities. I was uh, second chair in a case uh, where a victim made a statement uh, that uh, there, there was a freckle at 12 o'clock on the defendant's penis. Well, sure enough, there was a freckle at 12 o'clock on the defendant's penis. And we already covered the, the concept of fantastic statements. So taking a broad view of ways that we can corroborate uh, these types of statements is important. There's always a crime scene. There's always a crime scene. Uh, and so we need to photograph it. Um, and that can be useful in a variety of ways. Uh, for one thing, it can help uh, the child testify um, in, in a variety of ways. So we, and that can really increase credibility. So for example, um, he, I've, I've worked with several children um, who have just done a fantastic job on the stand uh, walking through photos of the house. And so I always tell my investigators, you know, take those four corner photos, a, a, sh a good shot with a high quality camera from each each of those four corners um, uh, of each room, uh, and certainly zooming in on on specific areas as well. And so for it, it, it can often demonstrate how credible the child is, and it can really bring the crime scene to life. Um, it's also important when you take those photos. Maybe some of those should be taken from the height level of the child, just to get a bit of a bit more of an accurate picture of how the child perceived things. Um, on, the, on the credibility side of things, um, you know, for example, if you have, uh, just going to one of my cases, we have a child who says, well, I was uh, sexually abused, it was a sexual contact over the clothes, uh, and it was in the kitchen. Well, this was an open concept house. Um, uh, and, but when the uh, child is shown images of the crime scene, without, obviously without any sort of suggestive guiding or things like that, um, the child indicates uh, that, that the sexual abuse occurred right in the corner of the island. Uh, and this child was short enough, so even if someone was standing in the living room in this open concept house, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have noticed it was a bar stool height, uh, L-shaped island that, that connected, you know, right to the sink and all that. That increased that child's testimony. The child, you know, another child who says, "Oh, I was touched on the patio," and then when we, uh, when, when shown the crime scene photograph, uh, sure enough, uh, where where she indicated it wasn't just out in the open on the patio; it was right up against the wall of the house. Uh, where at a point of minimum visibility where anyone inside the house wouldn't have seen it. Uh, that is really credible, uh, and it, it helps us rebut claims of coaching and things like that. All right, let's, um, let's think through this for a second. So um, the crime scene photos and corroboration. Let's do a quick, uh, let's make this as interactive as we possibly can. Obviously, we have some limitations and, and we could go a lot more in depth if this were in person. Uh, so I look forward to seeing all of you maybe uh, in person at some point when the world returns to quasi-normal. Uh, but let's review this uh, hypothetical. And if you all could just weigh in on the chat and think through how would photos 
help corroborate this child's testimony specifically? What would photos corroborate about this child's testimony? And hopefully this is an exercise that shows you that we need to look at every line, uh, every piece of a child's statement uh, that, uh, that could potentially be corroborated. Um, a lot of times we stop at, oh, I believe the child, I don't believe the child. That, that needs to stop. Corroborate corroborate every line of it. Uh, don't lean on your initial gut instinct. Uh, it is, it's, it's not all that reliable. Uh, we need to focus on the lines, corroborate it, and then make your investigative and prosecutorial decisions from there. So I'll go ahead and read through it as you all are processing and weigh in with how photos might help corroborate the child's testimony. The child says in a forensic interview, quote, Daddy came into my bedroom, removed the Winnie the Pooh book from the closet bookcase, and then sat on the edge of my bed. As he read the book, he placed his hands between my legs and moved his hand around. He then put the book on my nightstand, pulled me on the carpeted floor, and next to the bed, licked my coochie. And the forensic interviewer uh, follows up with an anatomical diagram where the child does indeed indicate that coochie is the child's vagina. So uh, you all have joined in impressively already. Let me look through what we have so far. Um, let's see. Uh, Jim Jolly, uh, thanks for t thanks for tuning in, Jim. Great to great to see you here. Jim is uh, doing some fantastic work in the great state of Florida. Uh, Jim says carpeted floor. Absolutely, that's something we can corroborate. John Hurdle says layout of the room. Yes, does the layout of the room match the child's description of it? Bethany says photos of the bedroom could show the layout of the room, such as the carpet, uh, location of the bookcase, location of the nightstand. Absolutely. Sue also points out the carpet of floor, the Winnie the Pooh book, the closet bookcase. John says existence of a book, right? Uh, the fact that the book exists is corroborative. It's not just something that the child fabricated. This is a child who has a legitimate attachment to reality. Uh, Jim also says the child's room. The fact that the child has a room can be corroborative. How many times have you all worked cases where the child doesn't have a room? Maybe they're crashed uh, somewhere in the living room, maybe on a couch. Uh, maybe the roof is caved in in the room and the child's not staying there. Uh, so even that itself absolutely can be uh, corroborative, the existence of it, and of course the details of it as well. Danielle says, where on the carpeted floor? Uh, Beverly points out several pieces as well. Elizabeth, location of the bookcase, definitely. The book in question is certainly something we want to focus on. Uh, pictures of the room, uh, Rhonda points out that we could use a doll uh, to clarify touches. There certainly is great research out there that says there's great efficacy in using anatomically correct dolls uh, to clarify uh, touches. Jim Jolly says DNA swab of daddy's hands, right? We can corroborate who daddy is um, and, and, um, and that relationship. All right, you all have weighed in a lot. That's fantastic. Let's, uh, let's, let's cover uh, just a couple of the pieces. So there's at least 10 aspects. Uh, the entryway, and if, if you all pointed this out, I missed it. The entryway, where the, where the daddy actually came into the room, that might not necessarily exist, right? The house is where the, the roof is caved in and whatnot, um, or, or the child doesn't have a room, uh, as, 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 as Jim's comment impliedly makes. So yeah, the, the fact that there's an entryway itself is inherently corroborative. The child has a bedroom. There is a closet in the bedroom. There's a bookcase in the closet. There's a Winnie the Pooh book missing from the closet bookcase, right? If it's right over there on the nightstand, right where the child said it would be, that would be significant. There's a bed for the perpetrator to sit on the edge of. Not all children have beds. Uh, there's a nightstand. And there's a Winnie the Pooh book on the nightstand. There's carpeted floor, as many of you pointed out. And then also there's room next to the bed to conduct the crime. All right, great stuff. Thank you all for weighing in on that. Um, but you can see how even a simple statement like that, there's a ton of things we can delve out. Uh, so thanks, every, for everyone, for weighing in in that exercise. Let's also think of mental health aspects to corroboration. Certainly, we could get additional insight into victim behavior and perspectives over the course of therapy. Um, I Those are perspectives, as a prosecutor, I really want in my case in chief uh, because we, we can't just throw a child on the stand and let them bear the entire burden of the case. They have to be surrounded. Even, even such things as where we put our witnesses in our witness lineup, those have to be victim-centric decisions. Uh, does the child have any, uh, any specific uh, unique behaviors that maybe we should uh, contextualize for the jury, maybe through a therapist, maybe the therapist the child works with? Uh, that might be something to do before we throw a child on there uh, without adequate support uh, and, and the jury makes these snap decisions uh, that, that hurt and, and, and lead to a poor outcome. Um, potentially that gives us an expert witness, uh, the, the counselor or, or therapist. Uh, maybe it gives us a, a support person for the child as well. And it depends on in some jurisdictions, uh, you might have to call the support person uh, first. 
Uh, in West Virginia, you're permitted to call the support person after the child, so they can be there for the child and then testify after. Just tactically, that was uh, an option that I used. Uh, but not all jurisdictions are like that, so certainly follow your local uh, guidance and, and code. Um, yeah, and, and maybe you need to have someone explain the nature of progressive disclosures. This is another reason why our forensic interviews need to be casting a really broad net uh, and exploring all possible forms of victimization. Um, we don't want to be asking a child, you know, how what usually happens or what sometimes happens. Um, we want the child to be walking through episodic uh, events. Uh, so tell me about the last time uh, that this occurred and walk through that. Okay, what about the first time? And then we can and pick specific events that we're exploring with the child. Uh, so we want to have uh, we want to be broadly exploring a wide away array of potential victimization. Um, and we also want to be doing that in a way that it's exhaustive in the forensic, or not exhaustive in the forensic interview, but it's detailed in the forensic interview. Um, but certainly, uh, it, it makes sense that a child's not going to disclose the uh, entire history necessarily of abuse in a forensic interview room to a complete stranger right off the bat, right? That might be something that comes out later on. So maybe this mental health piece can help us explain the concept of progressive disclosures uh, to, um, to the jury. All right, let's talk suspect statements. Uh, always a, a fun, fun, fun topic. So suspect statements, uh, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. We really got to lock in defendants and third-party witnesses as soon as possible, like in domestic violence cases. If we wait, uh, that story is going to change and, 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 and be fabricated to, to try to achieve max plausibility. Um, Oftentimes, in suspect interrogations, uh, perpetrators are trying to give a plausible statement. That means that they're going to corroborate many aspects of the crime. Sometimes I've seen investigators walk away from interrogations and said, well, he didn't, you know, he didn't confess, so I guess that's a waste. No, not at all. Uh, locking them into a statement is important. It's critical. Uh, and oftentimes they will corroborate many aspects of the crime, although they certainly don't perceive that that's what they're doing. So, for example, if we have a perpetrator who denies being a tech guy, uh, and yet uh, he's suspected of, uh, uh, of a variety of complex uh, technology-facilitated uh, crimes against children. Uh, well, uh, one case where that occurred, the investigator locked him into you know, what he does for hobbies, and he denies being a tech guy. Well, when we uh, looked in the garage, what did we find? All these computer devices in various stages of disrepair, uh, and it really hurt his credibility. And in that case, he was involved in a dark web uh, website uh, and was accessing horrific uh, material and, and utilizing, uh, you know, the Tor uh, network and, 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 and a variety of complicated mechanisms to uh, hide uh, his, his identity and his, and his location. Um, we can get we can have them give an accurate uh, password for the computer. Uh, oftentimes, uh, that might be the case, particularly if you uh, work that into more standard questioning. So, for example, uh, you might uh, there's an entertaining clip uh, from Jimmy Kimmel uh, where he goes around on the streets and gets people to give him his their passwords uh, just by asking them. You know, if you don't ask, uh, you might not know. You'd be surprised at what they'll give you, especially if you work it into, you know, what's your name, what's your address, what's your password, where's your kid go to school. Uh, that can all be useful. Um, we could also corroborate a uh, time frame of accessing devices, and that might match what we know of when, uh, for example, child sexual abuse material was uploaded or downloaded. Uh, so, for example, if he says, oh, I stay up late a lot, I'm on my computer working. Well, there we go. We just corroborated it. We've just put him behind that computer uh, in, a, in a certain time frame. And if we can lock him into particular days, even better. Um, talking to others in the house obviously is important. So, uh, for example, uh, in the case I'm thinking of, the wife corroborated the perpetrator's statement that he would stay up late on that computer uh, in case he later decided to try to throw his wife under the bus, which we've seen. We've also seen uh, perpetrators try to throw their kids under the bus for accessing child sexual abuse material, which is uh, a Father of the Year award for that one. Perp if the, per the wife also corroborated that the perpetrator was great with technology uh, and that the computer parts that were everywhere were his. Um, if we waited, uh, if we didn't immediately separate and take statements, we might have had a harder time. Uh, but as a result, uh, it was a pretty fairly easy win. And so witness statements themselves are certainly corroborative uh, evidence. And remember, corroboration certainly exists in suspect interrogations. Um, another point to make just with regards to uh, suspect interrogations, um, 
we need to, if we want to get greater corroborative information, we need to not stop. We need to, as investigators, stop talking. <laughs> sometimes, uh, some of the most frustrating moments is when you can, you almost see the suspect uh, feel the need to to throw something out there, and the investigator just dives in on some unrelated topic, uh, and you're kicking yourself uh, at what might have been. And generally, in general, if we can, um, what would be ideal is if, is following the 80-20 rule. You know, the perpetrator talking 80% of the time, uh, even without realizing it, he's going to give a wealth of corroborative information uh, if we can keep to that, that type of, 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 uh, of ratio. Don't forget the power of the pause. So, for example, uh, Glenn Hall, a convicted perpetrator out of the great state of West Virginia, had already confessed at this point to sexually assaulting multiple daughters, including when they were uh, the age of toddlers. And yet, despite that fact, uh, in his hubris, Glenn says, no, sir, I love my wife. I'd never cheat on her, as the detective is wisely trying to explore whether there have been other victims or, or affairs, uh, as, as it may be. Or that, that's how he's characterizing it. And so the detective has a great comeback. Uh, to what Glenn says there about not cheating on his wife, he says, okay, um, uh, and just lets the stupidity of that statement hang in the air. Uh, be comfortable with silence sometime. That can be a valuable investigative tactic. And then in, uh, after uh, Glenn's uncomfortable with the silence, he, he finally says, well, I guess as far as this situation that happened, yeah, that's still probably considered cheating. That's a great quote. Uh, that we wouldn't have gotten if the investigator uh, didn't just rely on the plow on the power of the pause. Another thing that uh, suspects might give us if we let them talk a little bit more uh, is how great they are, <laughs> how respected they are, how much their kids love them. Um, sometimes we need to redirect and get them back on the right path, but oftentimes that plays the case theme. So, for example, uh, many jurisdictions, including West Virginia, have a statute, uh, the, a particular sex crime, if there's a custodial element, uh, if the defendant was providing care, uh, custody uh, of the child uh, while, while perpetrating these offenses. Um, well, uh, if that's the case, all those things the defendant's talking about, all the wonderful things he's done for the child and how much the child relies on him and the, the child care provided and the food provided and the transportation provided, well, you just met the custodial element and you also illustrated the case theme that I'm going to argue to the jury in opening statement uh, and closing statement, uh, and I'm probably going to work into voir dire as well, the betrayal of trust theme. How, yeah, uh, the kid did love you and you did do all these things for the children. Uh, and guess, what did you do with that relationship? You betrayed it in the most horrific way possible. And so that builds directly into my case themes. Remember that corroboration itself often leads to confession. There's studies on this. Corroborating evidence more than doubles confession rates. And we also know it reduces child stress during court process. If we have a defense attorney uh, who all you have is the forensic interview, if you as an investigator just got the forensic interview and you didn't, hunt, you didn't look at every single phrase in that forensic interview, you didn't hunt down all these other corroborative pieces, uh, well, that defense attorney knows if I can intimidate that child on the stand, if I, can get, if, I can, if I can terrify them into silence on the stand, the case is over, you don't have anything else. But if the defense attorney sees how you corroborate every single line of the forensic interview, you have all these various photographs that build the child's credibility, you have all these different paths of evidence, be they digital or physical or what have you, then the defense attorney maybe isn't going to uh, attack the child as viciously during the court process uh, because he's going to look more ridiculous, uh, uh, because the jury is going to understand the strength of the case a bit more, uh, and so the defense attorney might try more subtle uh, tactics as opposed to brutalizing the child. Certainly we know that corroboration is a powerful predictor of charging uh, as well. Prior bad acts, goodness, one of the places where we can really uh, improve and, and, and expand. What do we know about prior bad acts from the literature? Well, we know that men who molest girls average 19.8 victims. Um, we know that men who molest boys average 150.2 victims. So before you conclude that this is just a he said, she said, did you look into the defendant's employment history? Did you look into other uh, potential places where the defendant might have had access to children? Did you look at reasons why the defendant keeps bouncing from church to church? Did you look at why they keep bouncing from school to school or whatever the case may be? Maybe before you conclude that it's a he said, she said, you should uh, maybe explore the possibility that there are another 150 victims out there. Incidentally, though, those aren't going to necessarily walk into your office. Maybe sometimes they will because of pretrial publicity. You're not going to find them unless you look. Uh, seek and you shall find, right? You need to look for these. Um, incidentally, there's a variety of reasons why it might be easier 
to sexually abuse a boy. Uh, we know that there are certainly uh, that boys experience abuse differently than girls. It's more socially acceptable. You hear jokes from Jay Leno, where were all these teachers when I was a boy? There are jokes even on a, on Saturday Night Live uh, about uh, how uh, it's 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 every boy's dream to really uh, be be sexually abused by their teacher. Um, because of those various social dynamics. Um, or from a fear of appearing weak uh, or potentially appearing gay, as, as some victims have described, many boys remain in silence and perpetrators take full advantage of that, as you can see by the literature. We know that evidence of abuse against another child was also strongly related to confession. So if you're in a suspect interview room uh, and it's not just this one kid, um, that gives you leverage that, that you can channel powerfully, potentially, into confessions. So in the corroborative process, have to be looking for multiple victims. Far more often than not, they exist. It's just a matter of locating them. In most jurisdictions, uh, this takes the form, uh, in terms of admissibility, it takes the form of Rule 404B evidence. Uh, so evidence of prior bad acts, uh, they're admissible to prove motive, opportunity, intent, a variety of other things. I often would admit due to absence of mistake uh, or, or lack of accident. So for example, the perpetrator uh, who says, uh, you know, I was uh, playing video games, and I admit I was playing video games with a child on a couch, and my hands just slipped in. They just slipped into the child's shorts. I don't know what to tell you it was a total accident uh, well what I what we're able to do is talk uh, is locate other victims in fact in that case uh, two other victims who said you know actually uh, the same thing happened and he just keeps having these these, these identical accidents uh, where he's slipping into all these little boys clothing uh, what are what are the odds right uh, it's ridiculous it enables us to rebut it uh, it was probably ridiculous on the front end but those additional victims clearly demonstrate absence of mistake and lack of accidents uh, some jurisdictions uh, allow you to show, use other prior bad acts uh, to show a lustful disposition towards a, a, a victim in particular, maybe children more broadly, or specific other children. So, for example, uh, the defendant who sexually assaulted multiple daughters had a lustful disposition towards a particular category of children. And again, have to be proactive. You often will not find these unless you are proactive. Um, now, I do say Rule 404B, uh, but another thing to consider, depending on your local joinder rules, is you can, of course, uh, potentially charge the defendant uh, for multiple victims in a single case, and, and certainly that makes for a strong case as well. Physical evidence. I can count on one hand uh, the cases where there was uh, compelling uh, physical evidence of a medical uh, sort, but certainly there are, are there other forms of medical, uh, there are other forms of physical evidence as well. Certainly in physical abuse cases, we're going to want to be photographing injuries on multiple dates. Uh, and again, domestic violence cases, we know that the injuries uh, can appear very different, and, and so at certain stages, they more accurately reflect the severity of the act. We want to be using a, a high-tech camera for that. Uh, again, we know that medical evidence is not going to be present all that often. This is a myth that we need to be dispelling for the jury because they might be expecting this. Um, so we know that uh, from Kaplan, uh, physical examination positive findings are no better than 3%. I typically don't expect to have these in, in, in cases. Um, yet, Despite that, we really need to be ensuring that children are receiving medical uh, exams for a variety of reasons. Uh, first and most importantly is the benefit to the child. Often we conceptualize the medical exam as this horrific process for children. Um, and certainly, I don't want to minimize the trauma of, of the entire process uh, to a child. It certainly is significant. But what we know from research is that there are benefits to the child. The child comes away often from these medical examinations feeling relieved. Maybe the perpetrator told them lies about their body, but just being reassured that their body is fine and it's okay, uh, that can uh, provide great benefit to a child. Um, and so if for, no, for, for no other reason than that, uh, it's an important thing to make sure that's part of our protocols and is being done and in as timely of a manner as possible. Certainly the timing of when we do these is certainly going to be determined of whether or not uh, medical evidence will be collected. Uh, we also know that uh, this might be these might be admissible statements. Statements that are made for medical diagnosis or treatment uh, are admissible uh, as a as a hearsay exception, and so that's another reason uh, why we we should certainly be ensuring that these are done. All right, let's consider a little bit a little bit more about medical evidence evidence in physical abuse cases. Uh, are the injuries consistent or inconsistent with history? I recall uh, a, a case uh, early on in my career. Uh, there was a gruesome injury to a child's face. 
Uh, there was dark bruising uh, right uh, in the, at the corners of her mouth into her cheek uh, on both sides of her mouth, so it was bilateral. Um, and then there was uh, what, tooling marks, so teeth marks on the, on, all along the inside uh, of, 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 her, um, of her mouth. Essentially, the child, it was a compression injury, it was a bilateral compression injury, so that child's face was grabbed uh, and, scree and, and, and crushed uh, with great force. And so how does the caregiver explain this? Oh, I think it's a spider bite. Uh, on both sides, uh, you know, kind of in the shape of, of fingers. Um, and then when that, uh, when the, the defendant caught the subtle hint that perhaps that wasn't a great uh, explanation, the defendant says, well, you know, there's this freakishly strong two-year-old next door, uh, and there's a, there's a white plastic hamper that you, uh, that's not the exact hamper, but a white plastic hamper. Uh, and this, this freakishly strong two-year-old uh, picked up this hamper and just whacked, uh, whacked my child just with, with, with vicious force. Um, well, that's fairly easy uh, to, to refute uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, oftentimes asking the defendant to demonstrate uh, either on video or even in the courtroom can lead to interesting things. Certainly be careful. There's a risk to that, uh, but perhaps not a high one. Uh, depending on the on the nature of the case, certainly we have to refute uh, claims of easy bruising and things of that nature. Location of injuries can be corroborative uh, of whether or not uh, abuse occurred. Um, so, for example, we know that children are forward moving; they're frontal explorers. Uh, so, most accidental injuries that we see are to frontal locations. My children are young. Uh, and so certainly, I've, we've seen more than our fair share of bruises, the bruises of the forehead, you might see uh, to the nose, the chin, palms, elbows, uh, all that, certainly common. Uh, but if we look at injuries to buttocks, uh, buttocks are, um, uh, uh, buttocks, uh, typically when you see an injury, that's an area of the body that's not susceptible to injury um, very all that well. Um, typically when you see injuries, that's indicative that sufficient force was, uh, that extensive force was used. Certainly injuries to genitalia are suspect abdomen, the back, lateral areas of the body. Why? Because children move forward. So why are there injuries uh, to, to these areas uh, elsewhere? They're more likely, not always, but more likely uh, to indicate abuse. Certainly injuries to the back of the head, uh, injuries, uh, pattern injuries, certainly suspect, obviously, if they're like an iron or things like that, uh, uh, that could certainly be corroborative as well. So at this point, I'd like to step back a bit uh, from what we've talked about. A lot of this has been more traditional and uh, encourage you to dream a little bigger when it comes to what might be available to you in terms of corroboration. Um, and I can't, of course, use the word dream without playing a clip from Inception. Cowboys would like to see as far as even worse than imagine. This helps us out. The stronger the issues, the more powerful the catharsis. How are you going to reconcile them if they're so strange? Well, I'm working on that, aren't I? Move fast. The projections are closing in quick. we got to break out of here before we're totally boxed in. Encourage you if you if you uh, couldn't make that out. Uh, that's Tom Hardy's excellent uh, character in Inception, who encourages Joseph Gordon-Levitt to dream a little bigger. So let's dream a little bigger in terms of what might be corroborative evidence. Let's start with social media. Um, there's, uh, I mean, if if you've been investigating for any point of time, you know that social media is a fantastic source of incriminating statements. Um, uh, 
we know that uh, oftentimes uh, suspects broadcast to the world uh, their various criminal activities. I'm sure you've seen photos, uh, whether they be in drug cases or even child abuse cases, of uh, photos or videos that are broadcast uh, to the world uh, evidencing their criminal activities and certainly intent. Uh, so uh, it's there. One point I do want to quickly make, um, it is uh, all social media accounts. Uh, all relevant social media accounts, the defendant, victim, key witnesses, they need to be looked at and documented immediately, immediately. Uh, law enforcement prosecutors, I know it varies by jurisdiction on, on who does what, uh, but preservation letters need to be sent out immediately, immediately uh, to, to preserve this evidence to ensure that uh, suspects don't remote wipe it or that it might not be, it might be automatically deleted by the provider. Uh, if you're waiting even three days, sometimes even one day, sometimes even less, uh, to send a preservation letter, you quite likely are losing evidence, even if the defendant's in custody, just based on a, a particular service provider's uh, data, data retention policies. After that preservation letter is sent out, it needs to be followed up with a search warrant if you're seeking content. Um, there's some subtleties there within the Stored Communications Act that we won't have time to go into. If you have questions on that, definitely reach out to me. Uh, but we, uh, we are collectively losing so much evidence uh, because we're waiting uh, in inexcusably uh, to, to send out preservation letters and appropriate legal process. Let's talk a little bit about emojis. Emojis themselves might be corroborative, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of them. Uh, there's a broader uh, presentation on this called Egg, of Eggplants and Umbrellas, uh, the Legal Investigative Implications of Emojis. Uh, obviously, everyone's familiar with uh, eggplants themselves. Bananas uh, often can refer to penis. Uh, sometimes you'll see carrot and pencil in more pejorative context. Scotch glasses, um, grapes, berries for testicles, peach buttocks. Um, now, what you might see perhaps in more escort ads occasionally uh, is the, the cherries there might refer to breast, virgin, child, childlike. You have the taco, you have the cat uh, for vagina, for anatomical emojis. Um, we also see uh, some relevant ones in people emojis. And again, uh, oftentimes in trafficking cases, maybe you can link a suspect to an escort ad. Uh, that contained emojis commonly associated with human trafficking. Now, obviously, these things don't always mean uh, human trafficking, right? Uh, just because your kid, you catch your kid sending a snowflake to another kid, that doesn't mean your kid's a crack dealer, though sometimes that refers to crack, right? Uh, maybe your kid's excited that it's snowing outside. So don't assume uh, your kid's a crack dealer, uh, but also uh, be aware that there might be some corroborative value to emojis themselves. Um, so, uh, and, and another thing, another point to make, traffickers have turned to emojis in escort ads. Um, it can be uh, harder to search for emojis than for text-based indicators of human trafficking. So, for example, and we could easily type into Google various search terms indicative of human trafficking uh, or, or child exploitation, right? Lolita, PTHC, uh, meaning preteen hardcore. Um, th those are fairly simple things to, to have web crawlers out, out and about for. Emojis may be a little more complicated, or at least that's the perception by traffickers. Uh, and so we see uh, increasing emoji usage in escort ads. Child childlike, child virgin with the flower, pair of traffic girls, pimp or money, minor under house arrest or pimp. Uh, we also see action emojis. Um, and so the mouth is self-explanatory for oral sex. You see male erection, pitching a tent, uh, male ejection, uh, singing with the microphone, female orgasm, the O shape uh, or the teardrops, uh, sexual intercourse, the male on the box, all things that might describe actions uh, in, within an escort ad. Technology emojis, these are fairly, uh, some of these are a bit less overt or explicit, x-rated video, x-rated chat, uh, all that stuff. And again, keep in mind, emojis can certainly mean different things to different users. One thing to definitely keep an eye on uh, as you look at escort ads specifically, that airplane emoji, the temp means temporarily in town. Um, oftentimes, that might even be accompanied by dates. You might see like the airplane emoji and then dates uh, that they'll be in a specific location. That's a significant red flag, as you might imagine. Dollars or the prize, um, you see there the rose. And obviously the fire there is an easy example of, look, that can, start, that can, be, that can be an innocuous uh, emoji as well that, that everybody uses. It doesn't mean that everyone who uses it is a trafficker. The condom there, the umbrella. So there you go. That's the of eggplants and umbrellas. The uh, condom is the umbrella. And so that might, there might be, just to follow up on the relevance of that, that might be there. There might be certain expectations for clients, 
quote unquote clients um, uh, in in prostitution rings or human trafficking rings might be expectations that you wear a condom or it's okay for you to not wear a condom and so that might be a corroborative piece there as well all right let's talk about social media communications uh, as evidence of grooming and I'm going to escalate my pace a little bit try to get through as much of this as possible we know that offenders often use age-appropriate language to communicate with minors so uh, you know if you have a, a, a blue-collar mechanic uh, who's normally chatting one, chatting or speaking one way but then while he's trying to solicit a minor for sex uh, he says OMG no you didn't uh, <laughs> that's sort of interesting the style of communication itself and the disconnect is, is entertaining if nothing else um, you'll often see fantasy rehearsal um, in uh, in communications between predators uh, and children um, so I won't delve too deeply into that this was a recent chat um, and and for sake of time I'll skip over it but pay attention to the methods of communication the grooming strategies the manipulative tactics you see here the offender uses in some emojis to seem more hip and cool um, so uh, just be aware of that but we'll skip through uh, just for the sake of time be aware of different re investigative resources that are out there um, if you're not on social media and child abuse cases you're uh, in my opinion you're committing malpractice there's malpractice there's so much great info out there this is a screenshot from OSINTFramework.com, O-S-I-N-T, Framework.com, uh, just showing uh, just specific tools that might be available to you. So you see, uh, if that's hard to make out, you have social networks is just one of the many uh, tools under OSINT Framework that you could use. Then it narrows to Facebook, then searching Facebook, and then you see on the far right all these different tools that might be available to you to Facebook. The lower thread that sticks out there is various tools under the dark web, a specific uh, browser under the dark web I would encourage you to check that out they had an amazing tool uh, earlier that's unfortunately no longer utilized but there is still some good stuff uh, on that website uh, finding people uh, go to people.com you can occasionally find the real person behind online identities I say that because uh, and I don't have a ton of experience with people.com but I say that to, to say you can't just assume uh, that you know you have this online identity and that's your guy you need to corroborate uh, a, an in-person identity for an online identity and don't skip that step uh, or the results could certainly be embarrassing uh, and more importantly unjust uh, there was a request for repeating that last website OSINT Framework, O-S-I-N-T Framework.com, OSINT Framework. They used to have, there used to be a, a piece under OSINT Framework called Intel Techniques. It might have been IntelTechniques.com. It was spectacular. You could put in a specific ID, like a Facebook ID, and you could search for uh, any Facebook post that the perpetrator commented on. Uh, and we, we use that to great success in our cases. Unfortunately, it's no longer an option, or at least it wasn't the last time I checked. Um, as you're doing online investigations, uh, you can use search modifiers on Google to make things more efficient. Uh, so for example, you can exclude terms by using the minus sign. You look for John Doe, just subtract the YouTube results by going minus YouTube. Uh, one thing that's really helpful, do that site colon search. Uh, so if you're just looking for Facebook what, Facebook pages, site colon, Facebook.com, Twitter, what have you. Uh, searching URLs only. Maybe you have uh, you found a username uh, and you know what his username is on Facebook well often offenders use the same username in a variety of places let's find out where else he was at uh, so let's search uh, in URL uh, maybe that username is in within the URL address itself the website address itself go, go I N U R L colon whatever that username is and put that in parentheses and you might find other places where he's popped up if he's using the same username you can also search by location so location colon state uh, might be another way if you're getting a bunch of results uh, from outside your jurisdiction and you want to tailor it searching by file type say you're working financial crime and you want to look for uh, Excel files do that file type colon XLS reverse image search you got an image you want to see where else it's popped up go to Google click on images and then click on the camera that's in that search bar then you can upload, click and drag, what have you, an image or URL of an image uh, into that and see uh, what else pops up. Sometimes you get some very interesting results. All right, digital evidence, even outside of social media. There are four general categories for it, um, and I am going to fly through this section just to give you a quick oversight, uh, and I'll, one, of, one of these will be flying through this slide. Um, we know that a variety of evidence might be found on a cell phone in a typical child abuse case. 
could be call logs, photographs, uh, video, audio, online accounts, email, social media accounts. Banking can be corroborative of, of access time frames, things like that. Cell site location information that tells us where the defendant was, billing information to establish identity. Certainly we're interested in browser history, data usage. Uh, subscriber information could give us uh, a, a ton of information uh, potentially on, on a specific target. Um, there's a variety of resources out there on this if anyone's interested. We don't forget about digital evidence and prior bad acts. So we could look for, for example, search terms that are indicative of child sexual abuse material, PTHC, preteen hardcore, Lolita, things like that. What about deleted file names? Uh, probably most prosecutors aren't able or, or even willing uh, to charge someone just for having a deleted file name, right? We've got to establish that beyond a reasonable doubt. But uh, if we have a file name that says, you know, 11-year-old uh, uh, raped by dad, and we know that maybe there's an in-person victim uh, that, that sort of matches that or shows preferences, even if it doesn't, it's corroborative, but if there's a specificity of preferences, it's even more corroborative, uh, that might be great prior bad acts to bring in, even though it might not constitute an individual criminal charge. Uh, don't forget EXIF data. Uh, now, social media platforms will scrub this, but most modern cameras, including smart smartphones, embed GPS coordinates uh, in the metadata, the underlying data of photos taken. So you see here at the bottom, there's a latitude and longitude uh, that shows where this photo was taken. You plug that into Google, and look, you can see on Google Maps where that photo was taken. Now, again, Social media platforms will scrub those from uploaded images. So if you're pulling an image from Facebook, it's not going to be there most likely. But check, uh, and that might corroborate it. And then you, if you go to that scene, uh, and you can take photos of that scene that then match that up, uh, that's another great corroborative uh, piece of evidence. I'm sorry, you're probably not seeing that. Uh, see here, you have the Google Maps. Uh, that's You see the latitude and longitude that we plugged in from the previous uh, screenshot of the exit data and the file itself. And then you see that's exactly where it is on Google Maps. Don't forget cell site location information. Um, that's, that's, of course, critical. Um, that can include latitude. That does include latitude and longitude information. You need to get a search warrant for cell site location information. Supreme Court and Carpenter v. United States. And again, there's a lot of nuances here I'm not going to go into. Uh, but uh, when in doubt, certainly get a search, search warrant get it for cell site location information. You could introduce that via investigator testimony, or you could do something that juries like, make it visual. Uh, don't just uh, numb them with, uh, with Excel, uh, massive Excel documents of latitude and longitude. Uh, show them uh, what it looks like. Um, and you have a couple examples of that. The one on the right uh, is NW3C's per pound tool. If you go to NW3, uh, the digit, uh, the letter, not the letter, the digit 3, NW3C.org, the per pound tool. Last I checked, that was up and free. Um, and so literally, you can just take the coordinates from the Excel file that you get uh, from, uh, from, from your search warrant return, plug them into per pound, and there you go. On Google Earth, you can see the data points for where the suspect was. Now, sometimes there's reason why uh, CSLI isn't accurate, and there's reasons that could be explained, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's typically going to be admissible, barring, barring some bizarre circumstance, assuming you've laid the appropriate foundation. If you're wondering, okay, how do I even know where to get this information? There's this new platform. I can't find it. Uh, how do I even know where to send a subpoena or search warrant or a preservation letter immediately? Uh, check out search.org. Uh, you can scroll down to the bottom, which I have in this screenshot. You see on the right side under quick, quick links, there's ISP list. Click on ISP list, and it has hundreds of, of, of companies, and you can go through those. Not only do they have uh, addresses, email addresses, sometimes phone numbers, they also uh, will occasionally have guidance for how to serve legal process, uh, just what some of the specific preferences of those uh, service providers are, which is incredibly helpful information. Don't forget, wireless routers um, are typically present pretty much everywhere now. That might uh, put an offender uh, at a particular scene at a particular time. Uh, maybe the device automatically connects to the router or intentionally connects to the router. Uh, definitely check that out. That can be a great source of information. A lot of times we miss those because they're on the ceiling or somewhere else. Put that on your radar, especially if you're trying to establish uh, that the perpetrator was at a particular location. Don't forget vehicle forensics. Um, Burla. Burla is great to work with. Um, I've, I've worked with at least one. Uh, well, I've worked with one representative of Burla who was a law enforcement officer. Uh, this is good stuff. You can get vehicle events, uh, event logs that are associated with different activities, such as door opening, 
gear shifts, ignition cycles, speed logs, location data, connected devices. You might, depending on the make and model of the vehicle, retain incriminating information, maybe incriminating text messages, maybe call logs that's still on the vehicle. Maybe you can't get into the phone. Maybe the phone's encrypted um, or, or destroyed or what have you. Maybe it's still on the vehicle itself. So um, think of that. Definitely put that on your radar. Uh, and I would ask uh, Victoria if you could copy and paste into uh, the chat a, a specific link on Burla's website. Um, and this isn't the main page to Burla. This is a vehicle lookup for Burla. So you can hop on this website uh, and you can look up uh, you can look up the make and model of the car, and it'll tell you what type of data, what type of forensic data might be available on the specific make and model of this particular vehicle. Tremendously useful tremendously useful information. I strongly encourage you uh, to check that out. Uh, it's something I wish I would have known about a lot earlier because <laughs> there's just a great, great value to that. Don't forget about wearable tech. Um, and uh, William, I know my time is waning, but I'll, I'll wrap it up shortly. Wearable tech. Um, you know, there is um, – uh, this was an article uh, where uh, allegedly there was a false rape report, and the report was allegedly disproven by Fitbit data that, al that the alleged victim was wearing uh, during, during the assault that was alleged. So uh, you, you see the title of this, Wearable Devices as Admissible Evidence Technology is Killing Our Opportunity to Lie. Think about maybe a Boy Scout type scenario where um, uh, you know, uh, we have a scout leader and we suddenly see his heart rate spiking at 1 a.m. while he's alone, uh, unsupervised, in a tent full of little boys. Wouldn't that be interesting corroborative evidence to have uh, in, the, uh, in the event of an allegation? So something to keep in mind, dream a little bigger. Uh, Amazon Echo uh, or Alexa uh, is always listening. Alexa is always listening for wake words. Uh, if Alexa uh, hears a, thinks she hears a wake, wake word but's mistaken, sometimes that is recorded. Uh, and so if you have an Amazon Alexa, uh, you can log into your account and you might even be able to see that. We have a search warrant here in, in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, in a uh, murder case uh, for for what Alexa uh, may or may not have heard. Let's not forget about the Internet of Things, um, and I know we're uh, short on time, um, but uh, William, since I answered several of the questions uh, early on, let's go ahead and play this video just to show you how even something innocuous like a mirror might be a fantastic repository of evidence.
There you go. So in case uh, in case you can't get enough of politics uh, and, and you just need it uh, to infiltrate uh, your your morning routine as well, there you go. That's the the mirror for you. I mean, look at all the stuff that could be on there, right? Obviously, browser history, you name it. Um, now, a concern might be, you know, if there's camera components here, uh, what's the cybersecurity of those? This might be a whole, you know, additional issue in terms of hacking and, and things of that nature. Um, it's not just mirrors. It's everything. Um, it obviously, you know, of course, video games can be sources uh, of, of digital evidence. You have the, uh, the juvenile who confessed to murdering another juvenile uh, in a World of Warcraft chat session. Um, and so video game consoles are... are they're computers. They're very sophisticated computers that are capable of, of storing a bunch of corroborative evidence. There's a graphic uh, from ICP that Victoria will share in the chat, uh, the ICP Cyber Center, and it's a uh, it's a model of a house, and you can click through the house. And it'll show you all the potential devices in the house that are part of this Internet of Things, this Internet-enabled devices that are potentially sources of digital evidence. Um, it's, and it's everything you can imagine and then some. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out to think a bit broader. Now, you might be saying to yourself, look, I'm in a small rural jurisdiction. Uh, that mirror looks uh, pretty cool and or terrifying, but you don't know my defendants. Uh, my defendants certainly aren't, aren't uh, uh, using things like this. Um, well, you know, my defendants, uh, you know, are all, uh, you know, they're, they're having a variety of issues. I mean, they've got pacemakers, et cetera. Well, let's start with a pacemaker. Um, there's a, a case uh, where a pacemaker uh, was uh, a source of digital evidence um, that, that came into play in an arson investigation. Uh, so, for example, in this case, um, this was an Ohio case, a house nearly burnt to the ground, uh, and the uh, resident of the house told investigators he was sleeping when the fire started. Uh, he was able to pack some items in a bag and then climb out of his bedroom window to escape the flames. Uh, but the story didn't add up, and so the investigator decided that the key to the case might be data recorded by the suspect's pacemaker. And the detective said, quote, he told police about his medical problems and kept saying, woe is me, and someone had that eureka moment to get that search warrant for his pacemaker. Uh, and sure enough, uh, the pacemaker showed he was active. There was a cardiologist who reviewed data pulled from the pacemaker, determined it did not support the suspect's account, uh, and the doctor said in court documents, quote, it is highly improbable Mr. Compton would have been able to collect, pack, and remove the number of items from the house, exit the bedroom window, and carry numerous large and heavy items to the front of his residence during the short period of time he has indicated due to his medical conditions, and all that's based on the data pulled from the pacemaker. Um, so don't assume uh, you might as well assume that most devices are connected to the Internet at this point, and that means there's potentially corroborative evidence. And this can go to even uh, you know more disturbing places, for example, teledildonics, uh, which is the control of sex toys via the Internet. Uh, so these are a couple direct quotes uh, from, from uh, manufacturers and distributors of teledildonics. Um, we see Bluetooth and Wi-Fi features make it possible to use over a short distance around the world. Uh, a bit of marketing here, the device makes it so you can connect directly with online videos from the flashlight models. You can bring your fantasy to life. Uh, and then uh, the bottom, uh, most interestingly, the, there's the odometer, O-H exclamation point, odometer. It helps in keeping track of your orgasms. This way you can set your sexual satisfaction targets for the month or week and then make sure to reach that goal. What data is tracked in all that? Um, perhaps there's heart rates. If, that's, if those are utilized uh, in, in sexual abuse or sexual assaults, uh, you might very well have actual digital evidence of the sex crime itself, potentially. So just to put that on your radar. Um, and one of the last artifacts I want to mention is Google Dashboard. Um, you can certainly uh, refute perpetrator alibis with location data, hence the importance of cell site location information that we talked about earlier. Google Dashboard's a bit different if it's enabled, uh, which by default, it used to be enabled by default. It's not enabled by default anymore. Uh, but if you haven't changed back, it's still there. It'll show anywhere a connected device has been ever. Um, or I think it might be like with a five-year limit or something like that. Uh, but go and check yours if you have a Google account or a Google-enabled uh, device um, because it showed, you know, when I looked at mine, um, you can see not just everywhere I've been or everywhere that device has been. You can see how fast that device is going, whether you were driving, whether you were walking. Uh, there was one trainer who said he could tell when he was biking based on the information available on Google Dashboard. 
So a couple of pointers here. Uh, maybe turn it off on yours, <laughs> uh, but be alert for that. Um, and if they have Google Connected devices, get a search warrant for it, because uh, it could be the death uh, of the alibi between that and cell site location information. That type of detailed information, incidentally, uh, is why many courts are so n nervous about a lot of this information. Uh, so you really need to be using search warrants so we don't create more bad case law. Uh, don't forget potential related trainings. Here again, you have my email address, robert.peters at zeroabuseproject.org. Please reach out to me if there's any way I can assist you. I want to end by saying, um, you know, just in this COVID era, there's been a tremendous increase, uh, we know, in online sexual exploitation. We've seen increases in live streaming of child sexual abuse. Uh, some jurisdictions are reporting physical abuse increases as well. Um, and so that can certainly be something that's intimidating. Um, and, and how do you even begin to, to make a difference with all of that? Uh, so you might be thinking, um, I've already been outed as a huge nerd uh, with, and when we talked about Marvel earlier, um, but to shift to another fantastic franchise, you might uh, be echoing the words of Frodo, you wish that none of this had ever happened. Um, and as Gandalf said, just remember, so do all who live to see such times, that is not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given you. So thank you all for dedicating your time today to improve your craft, uh, to improve your service to children. If there's anything we can do to assist you at Zero Abuse Project, that is why we're here. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Um, appreciate it, Robert. And um, were there any questions that you'd like to answer? We have about um, four minutes. And so if, is there any question, Robert, that you have? Uh, that you like to address, or did you want to go ahead and just uh, wrap up? Yeah, I um, I don't have access. Um, I'm looking to the chat really quick, seeing if I see any questions. Uh, but the questions that were raised before the presentation, I worked uh, in already. So um, happy to answer any others if there are. Uh, but appreciate all okay. the the kind words in the chat. And again, please reach out if there's any way we can assist you. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. So we'll, uh, no questions came into the chat, so we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up today's webinar. Uh, again, wanted to uh, thank you, Robert, for a great presentation. Uh, definitely the first webinar I've been on that was ended with Lord of the Rings, and uh, I'm a better person for that quote, so thank you for that. Um, so for those who are looking to get in contact with INTAC, please uh, reach out to us through the information on this slide. You can also check us out on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. If you're looking to get in contact with OJJDP, you may do so through the help desk. Uh, reach out to the help desk on the information on this slide through this 1-800 number and also through this email address. You can also sign up for their listserv if you're looking to get more information about OJJDP related um, events, including web events. Do you have a training or a technical assistance need? Well, if so, you can uh, reach out to the, or you can submit your request, excuse me, through the uh, TTA360 platform. You can go to tta360.ojjdp.ojp.gov to submit your request for training and technical assistance. Uh, please note that we will have this webinar posted. Uh, to our YouTube page, and if you'd like to get uh, access to transcript or supporting materials, you can reach out to the OJDP Help Desk. Please take a moment to review this slide where we include the attribution and the disclaimer. And join us for the next upcoming Zero Abuse webinars. We have two that are coming up on October the 13th and 20th. Please be sure to register for each of these uh, webinars. Uh, please note that the uh, webinar on the 13th is for prosecutors. And then we also have a couple of webinars with our colleagues with the Western Regional Child's, uh, Children's Advocacy Center. You can register for these webinars here coming up on the 6th and the 20th of this month. And finally, we have webinars with our colleagues with uh, the Innocent Justice Foundation that are coming up on the 14th and the 28th. Uh, please be sure to register for these webinars as well.
And before we end, we do have one final poll question uh, for folks to address. And we'd like to know, uh, how do you plan to apply? Oops, hold on one second. Let me fix this really quickly. Here we go. All right. How do you plan to apply the information from this webinar? Please note that this is multiple select, so you can go in and actually select multiple options here for the for this particular um, answer, for this particular poll question. Just feel free to go in and let us know. How do you plan to apply the information from this webinar in your work? I'm going to leave this up for about another uh, 40 seconds or so. So please feel free to complete this particular poll question. And again, thank you to our audience and thank you to our presenters. Everyone have a great afternoon, and we will see you on the next webinar. Take care. The host has left the meeting. So at this time, the meeting will come to an end. Thank you, and goodbye.